appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do is build on what we've done for the past week and a half and um, use the skills that you've had an opportunity to try on several times to actually look at a, at a similar situation we were dealing with um, two days ago. So at the end of this session, you'll, we'll have um, critically appraised a systematic review. That's what we're going to do. You're going to, we're going to reinforce the concept of heterogeneity and look at that, and you'll be able to label the three tools that we use to assess heterogeneity. So just going back through the very, very beginning, on the very first day, we looked at questions and what they were, and we went over background questions and W5, who, what, where, when, and why. Then we looked at foreground questions, and we used PICOS, and we've re, uh, referred to that several times over the past week. The patient, the problem, um, the population, the intervention, the comparison intervention, the outcome, and the study type. And so we used that then to go to the second step of evidence-based medicine, how do we find the evidence? And we talked about quality filtered uh, literature as a quick way for us to get an answer and not spend all the time critically appraising and where to find some of those sources. We looked at literature searching using PubMed clinical queries and then quality filtered literature, we looked at tripdatabase.com, clinicalevidence.com and scholargoogle.com. So we tried those all as different events to go through to find literature. Then over the past time, we've really just been con um, looking at articles that are concerned about treatment. We haven't gone into diagnostic tests. We haven't looked at prognosis, harm, or etiology as the other ones. We've been concentrating on two of the basic cores, the therapy. And we went through the validity of therapy, and we've reinforced the concept of randomization and what it was and why it had to be hidden. We looked at the concept of intention to treat analysis, that people need to stay in the groups that they were assigned to for, so that no bi bias can enter the study because of that. And then we looked at the uh, measurement bias called allocation concealment or blinding, hiding. Um, can people figure out what drug they're getting? Can the person giving the drug figure out? And the, can the person doing the statistics at the very end figure out what people got? And we explained why that could bring bias into the study as well. Then we went over a systematic review at the beginning of this week, and we looked at validity. We, went, we said that validity, unlike this here, involves steps of evidence-based medicine. Did they have a good, really good question? Did that question, was it searched properly? And did they have lots and lots of opportunity to find as much evidence as possible? And then we talked the third step about uh, quality assessment of those studies, not of the patients that participated, but the studies. Because a systematic review, it studies studies and um, clinical trials. It doesn't study patients. And then we looked at the results, and we really concentrated on the concept of heterogeneity so that you would feel comfortable reading a systematic review and understanding what people are doing. So today I'd like to go through a clinical case scenario, and then we're specifically going to critically appraise a systematic review and talk about the applicability. So as I said, this is the case that we used a few days ago. A visiting a phys uh, physician is sitting at Hanover Rounds here, and he listens to a conversation about GCSF and colony stimulating factor, and there is a need to use approximately a million dollars worth of Egypt, a million Egyptian pounds worth of GCSF before the end of the year because there's an oversupply here at the hospital. And as, as he was listening, he noticed there's lots of different opinions of what to do and lots of different questions, well-built clinical questions were being formed by people and reflected that really those questions are the same questions that he hears at home in Canada at the time as well. And so he put that together, and we came up with this article here when we looked for a randomized control trial, which we did two days ago. Um, and we went through that article, and we critically appraised it. We decided that it had good randomization, that we could not determine if the randomization was hidden. There was an intention to need treat analysis, and the prognosis of the two groups as they were selected in the randomization process were good. But we said we had real concerns because allocation concealment could be broken. Because it was GCSF, the patients and the parents could figure it out, the clinicians could figure out who was getting GCSF, and even the people assessing the outcome of the study could figure it out. But we thought the follow-up was very complete. So we came to the conclusion and we used the numbers and we, we came up with um, numbers needed to treat for febrile neutropenia at seven days, 10 days, neutropenia at 10 days, and fever. And these three here 
were quite tight. The number needed to treat was between one to two. So for every one patient I treat with GCSF compared to no GCSF, um, I would need to treat one less patient to see one patient get better. And that was quite a statistical uh, p-value as well. And all these calculations can be done on this website down here called www.cebm.utoronto.ca. And it's run by Sharon Strauss out of, um, she was in Toronto in Calgary and now is back in Toronto. But it's the Centers for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Toronto. And it has a very easy um, program that you can load with Java. And you can also download the software onto your Palm Pilot if that's what the type of instrument you have or the um, Microsoft Windows Palm. It does not work on Blackberries, but you can download the software so you can set up the two by two table. So we were quite impressed with this. I think this conclusion is in children who have a febrile neutropenic episode, who have leukemia, who present to the hospital, there could be, by, based on this study, a benefit to giving them GCSF because there would be, you could discharge them quicker from the hospital. So, I went on and, and developed the same question. This is identical, except now I changed it to systematic review to see what would come up. And then I went looking for the evidence, as we would in the second step at evidence-based medicine. Now, just for an understanding process, I did define what the MESH headings. So these are the medical subject headings. And neutropenia, febrile neutropenia does not map as a MESH heading. Um, when, you, when you put it in PubMed, you'll find that you can't find that. So, but neutropenia is a medical subject heading. And GCSF actually maps to granulate colony stimulating factor with the hyphen in it to search it. So I did that just to make sure I could maximize my searches. So the first thing I said, well, I'd go right to systematic reviews. I clicked on clinical queries in PubMed. I went to systematic reviews. I pumped col granulocyte colony stimulating factor and neutropenia in. I pushed the go button and bang, I got 11 articles of which the first one was a meta-analysis of the effect of prophylactic hematopoietic colony stimulating factors on mortality and outcomes. Now I did do one thing, I did apply a limit because I was most only concerned about children. Um, if you click on this button up here in PubMed, you can look at the, you can set limits so that it, it scans only for children. Now somebody had asked me where could they quickly find review articles. Well, if you click over here, this applies, PubMed applies a second filter and gives you just review articles as well versus the total of 11 articles that it found. So I thought, oh, I'd try Google Scholar and see what came up there. Well, I did Google Scholar. Um, I typed in the exact same, and I'm sorry it doesn't project as well, granulate colony stimulating factor in neutropenia. Um, and I did limit it to the past 2004, but this article still comes up as the first article, um, which is the one we reviewed in pediatric and blood cancer two days ago. And the third article is the same article that PubMed found as well in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2004. Then I went to trip database to see if I could do it. I pumped in the same words again. I clicked on search and I got this selection here. Now I just do want, I will explode this to a larger picture in the second to show you. But so there's quite a lot of articles and I needed to look at systematic reviews, evidence-based synopses. So what I actually did is um, I applied a filter as well. And trip database has a nice little filter here that you can apply by specialty. Um, and so I applied pediatrics and searched. Um, somebody had asked me a question, where could they get information that was background information? Well, that's what the nice thing about uh, TRIP database is. It gives you e-textbooks, and it's, it's looking for everything that's written in major textbooks about um, GCSF and neutropenia, and there's 87. So if you need background information as well, TRIP database is very helpful for you to find relevant, um, good quality uh, filtered evidence-based textbooks. And in some case it'll be, if you're in Google, it'll be Google Books, which actually um, some of the big textbooks have allowed certain chapters to be printed. Um, you can find that by searching. So, And then also it does a basic Medline search for you here as well. If you are looking for foreground information, it doesn't count, tell you the number of articles, but it does the basic PubMed Medline search automatically for you. So after applying the filter of pediatrics, um, we found out that there was a variety of articles. Some of them um, 
are interesting in, in the sphere. They're not exactly identical to the ones that I found with Lillian Sung, but it is in there. It's just a f bit further down. So lastly, I'd just like to show clinical evidence. This is the British Medical Journal website. Um, you can click in here and apply the information. Um, where you go is that you put in the information up here. And I said I gave me two searches, two articles but actually none of them were useful and they were about HIV and granulocyte. Again, clinical evidence is actually more of a textbook of clinical evidence, so a lot of times it doesn't have information that you may, be, may need, but it is a good place to look. So I thought lastly I should go to the Cochrane database and I'll explode this a bit bigger in a second. I just applied the exact same words in here. I looked for title abstracts um, in, in that part, or keywords, and it produced, the Cochrane database showed me five articles, of which the fifth one was a colony stimulating factor for the prevention of myelosuppression therapy induced febrile neutropenia in children with ALL. Now, I, I haven't pulled this one, I did not look at it, but there is actually a Cochrane review. The disadvantage of using Cochrane reviews, and this is just a standard of a teaching, is that um, this review, I think, is almost 100 pages, and producing that as a, as a learning tool in this situation is a, killing a lot of trees. Um, you can take a look at it by just pumping the words into the Cochrane Library. And I understand, Dr. Sharif, that they have access to the Cochrane Library here at the, at the, at the hospital. So. Onwards to the article by Dr. Lillian Sung um, from the Hospital of Sick Children in Toronto. Um, Lillian's a phenomenal um, a presenter and a very interesting uh, physician. She did her um, pediatrics and then she did her pediatric oncology and then she said she felt he, she needed to really do pediatric infectious disease so she did another three-year fellowship and then she decided to do a PhD in epidemiology on top of that. And she's also married and has three kids. So I don't know how she managed to cram that in. So let's try this um, article right here. We're going to look among children and adolescents with febrile neutropenia, does GCSF versus placebo decrease mortality? And I'm just going to hand out the article. The article is abbreviated. Um, it's actually 17 pages, but I've, it's actually 34 pages, and we've cut it down to just the relevant components of pediatrics. Um, just, just because I, um, if you want, you can get the article freely. It's available free online. Sorry, I forget to take some of these. Sorry. So, so you can down a lot of times um, lead articles that are important. Um, you can use to uh, you can find online, and actually, if you search it in PubMed, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, Elsevier in this situation gives you free access to this article. Um, it's not all articles, it's certainly more seminal articles that are of interest that they do that for you. So if you wanted to read the whole thing and go through it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, a, um, just as we've done on the other two, two three times, is to work um, to read the article and to look at it from a critical appraisal point of view. So I'd like you to just take um, five minutes and only read the abstract. And we're going to use that, and I'm going to help you work through the rest of it with the worksheet. So just take, it is 9.14, we'll just give you three, four minutes, we'll, 9.17, we'll come back. So just read the abstract and think, what are they doing here? And from what you've heard from the other sessions, are they doing it um, that's going to be helpful for us to get some information out of it? So just the abstract, that's all you need to read.
So we'll give you another 30 seconds. And if you don't manage to get through it all, don't worry, we're going to work through it as a group, so... Okay, so don't forget, there's a million Egyptian pounds worth of GCSF in this hospital. And if we're going to use that drug, we should be using it, using best practice, and we should be checking the evidence and whether it can help us in a variety of different ways. So um, we're going to go through the validity steps of critiquing this article. Remember that in a systematic review, the critical steps are the steps of evidence-based medicine. Was there a really good question? Was it written correctly? Can you identify the PICO components? Did they do a really good literature search? Did they find all the evidence in the world possible out there? And once they found those articles from the literature search, did they apply good systematic criteria to assess the quality of the articles? And did they assess all the articles equally? And can we use that information? Um, was there any publication bias in that? And then the last question is, is the article well enough written that people could repeat this experiment, that you could read this article and use the protocol they've decided that you would feel comfortable about? There's an extra article down, deck down here, Dr. Iman, if you needed one. Did you get, did you, okay. So let's work through it. So validity, remember validity is how close is what's been done here is to the truth. The truth is that if you had every single patient who would ever receive GCSF in the world, and that would be a very big and expensive experiment to do. So we're taking a little snapshot, and we can do that by looking as we did yes, two days ago to the randomized controlled trial and sort of extract that from 60 patients. And I think as Dr. Haney said, um, that was one of his points, is that there's only 60 patients in that study, and it was conducted over four years. Um, one of the reasons, I'll be quite honest, one of the reasons for choosing that article is your hospital has such a large number of patients that I would challenge you that somebody could repeat th that experiment here, probably have a lot more patients in it, and um, give and help us in the rest of the people treating cancer by using the patients that you have here um, with that GCSF. So I, don't, I would hope somebody may rise to that challenge. So did the review explicitly address a sensible clinical question? So we're going to look for the PICO question. Now looking in the abstract, is there a PICO there? Okay, and, and what are the parts of the PICO that you see there? The patients, that's right. And, and so it gives us information about the patients. Does it tell us about the intervention in that? And does it tell us about a comparison intervention? Yes. It does. And does it mention outcomes? Yes. Yeah, and it mentions a lot of different outcomes, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know if people found just reading the abstract. It's pretty easy to read till you get to the data synthesis in the second column, and then all these numbers start flying at you. So just to look at that. But, but remembering the numbers are only one part of the, of the critical appraisal. You've got to make sure you have a good question, because if you don't have a good question... So if I, had a, if I was doing a research project and I was going to look um, for a good research question, what about if I said um, my P was all patients with cancer, my I was all types of treatments for cancer, my comparison intervention was no treatment for cancer, and my outcome was mortality? Is that a good question? No, not really, is it? Yeah, because one, the outcome's going to be, if you don't treat, the outcome's pretty standard. But plus it's, how can I apply all those different interventions to all those different patients if I'm looking at people from zero to 99 who have cancer? So, so that's, that's not a sensible question. What if I was going to look at um, all children with otitis media, or sorry, all children with otitis, and the intervention was antibiotics, and the comparison intervention was no antibiotics, and the outcome was resolution of symptoms. Is that a reasonable question? Why, what bothers you about that? Yeah. 
So, so you, you guys are doing that really well because you're applying the biological criteria, the biology of the patient, the biology of the population, the biology of the uh, problem being addressed. You're looking at the biology slash pharmacology of the intervention and you're looking at the outcome. So when the biology of the different events doesn't jive, doesn't, doesn't um, come together, then you should be concerned. What if I was just going to look at um, all cases of acute otitis media in children from zero to two years of age, um, antibiotics versus no antibiotics and the outcome? No, so, so people still, what about um, aspirin for people with transient ischemic attacks? So patients with transient ischemic attacks, does aspirin versus no aspirin improve symptoms? Is that a good question? Sorry? Um, yes and no, yes and no. Sorry, go, Dr. Iman? <laughs> well, is, Dr. Medea, is it, is it a better question than... <laughs> Okay, so so back to the otitis media question. Uh, uh, somebody is concerned that you can you need to treat children with otitis media. I actually encourage you to look at the Cochrane database and search that, because um, the latest Cochrane's actually say that it's probably better not to treat otitis media, not in children with cancer. I think children with cancer are totally different than, than but in the general population because of the concern of drug use. Now again. You take that information, you review the evidence, and then you apply your patient interve your patient's uh, preferences, your preferences, the preferences of society. That's evidence-based medicine. The evidence is there, but you still need to apply patient values, patient preferences, physician values, physician preferences, society's values, and society's preferences. So, so the last one that was stroke and aspirin is actually a very tight question. Again, because the biology of people who have TIAs doesn't vary as much. Aspirin has one mechanism of action, we believe, so it doesn't vary as much. So that would be a, a very good question. But that's what you're essentially doing here. So we looked at the question, um, and we said, um, do prophylactic GCSF decrease all-cause um, all and infection-related mortality? And then they give a bit further, so, so the, it is a, a pretty reasonable question, and, and it, it has exploded a bit better in the article. So we said their question's relevant and good, and um, it, it meets our criteria. The next thing to look at is whether or not they did a good search. So they actually give a, quite a detailed protocol that they've developed, because this is actually the second article they've written about this. They did this article, I think, in 1999, and then they redid it in 2004. Uh, 2007, sorry, and there was a 2004. They, they did the first one in 2004, and this one's 2007, it was printed. And they performed an electronic searches using Ovid Medline, so that's the National Library of Medicine of the United States. Um, MBase, which is the Elsevier, which is the other big database, mainly comes from Europe articles. Remembering um, both of these don't overlap, so you're doing both. And then they went and looked at the Cochrane Central Register of Control Trials, or the Cochrane Database of Control Trials, so the CRCT, which you have access to by accessing the Cochrane. And um, they included the following words. They used granulite, they used the mesh headings I talked about, they used neoplasms for cancer, they used stem cell transplant and bone marrow transplant. And then they also abbreviated it, and they also wrote to the drug companies. So, so they, it was quite extensive what they did. They did spend a lot of time um, running it through. Um, they, one of the things that they didn't do is they just looked at these two databases. So they didn't look at LILACs, they didn't look at the Spanish database. Um, which would be most of Spain and Mexi uh, Central and South America if there was articles coming out of there they didn't find. And again, of course, um, the extensive, I don't know how much GCSF is used in China, but in those countries uh, where there's a, almost a billion people, if those trials are going on, we're not getting any information. But it's pretty, it's, it's pretty qu high quality, this is that's being done. She actually gives a, 
a flow chart explaining what they did, that they found 4,000 studies, they read the abstracts, and they didn't meet the criteria, so they got rid of about 4,000 of them. They had 287, 148 when they sort of excluded absence of a placebo group, allocation wasn't randomized, intervention not administered, systemically different chemotherapy, systemically different supportive care, duplicate publications, remembering a lot of times people will publish an abstract or a short article and then they'll follow it up with a second article. So you don't want to double count the results. So you, you try to find out if there's the same there. And if they used anything other than GCSF and GMCSF, if there was another growth factor that you were using, they didn't want that done. So I'd like you to point to um, go to table one and because we're mainly concerned about pediatrics, that it does have a pediatric arm to it. So there's 18 studies that felt were pediatric, 60 which were adult, and 13 which were older. So that's what we're looking for, is can we make a decision based on the data from there? So the next question is, so we said there was a really good question. We said that they did a really good search. Now, were those studies that they did, were they of good enough quality? Now, these are the criteria we're going to use. We're going to use all those criteria we did when we critically appraised a therapy article. We're going to assess where they randomized. We're going to assess whether the randomization was um, hidden. We're going to assess whether there was an intention to treat analysis. We're going to assess whether there was... Um, similar prognostic groups at the start. We're going to assess, could people figure out blinding, allocation concealment? And we're going to assess, did everybody who enrolled in the study stay in the study or follow up? So if we do that, you can do that for every single article, and you actually do. But there is an interest, is that there's something called the Haddad score. And Dr. Alejandro Haddad um, is at, in Toronto. He's a Colombian um, who studied in Oxford. And many years ago, about a decade ago, he did his PhD thesis on whether or not you could take all those criteria and compress them to get the really strong points. And so when you're reading a systematic review in uh, the Cochrane or anywhere else, you should be looking for a Haddad score or a, a score of allocation concealment called the Schultz score. And the Schultz score is what the Cochrane actually does, but they actually also ask you to do a Haddad score. So um, you'll notice that they combined the data at the study level, um, for, and this is the in more t outcome we're worried, worried about. Um, and for all-cause mortality, we also, um, sorry, they did a relative risk less than one, suggests that CSFs are associated with a reduction in that outcome. So if we can find a relative risk less than one, then we would be happy. So that's how they synthesized the data. And this is the Haddad score. And it's a very simple score. It doesn't, there are critics of it. Um, you can, it's found um, probably the night, you can go get the articles out of the original literature he did in 1996. But Wikipedia also has a very nice little quick review for you about it, and it'll save you some time. But what happens is for each of this, these, you get a one or a zero. So it's an absolute. And when you're reading the articles, you're scoring it absolutely. So was the study randomized? If they use the word randomized, you get one, or random, or random allocation, you get one. But if they can think of a way to say randomization without using the word randomization, and you even are sure that it's randomization, but they haven't used the word randomization, because they describe the technique that, um, but they don't use the ra word random, they don't get a point. So it's very, very tightly applied. And the same was double-blinded. You may use the word blinded and you're assuming everybody's reading the article and assume it's double-blinded, but unless they say double-blinded, you don't get a point. So you could, you could say it was single-blinded or you could say it was blinded, no point, that's zero. You have to say double-blinded. Like this is, he's applying the criteria very strictly. So withdrawals, so that's the question. So these are allocation concealment. This is randomization. Withdrawals is the concept of follow-up. If people leave the study, did they withdraw from the study? So he's looking at follow-up, and then he asks, for, you get a further point if you really describe the randomization well, and if you can describe the blindness. So you may say it's, you may not say double, so you'd get zero there, but you've, you describe it, you can still get a bonus point. And it's scored out of five. And then there's funnel plots as well for publication bias. So I just cut 
two pieces out. This is they described the method um, for pu for publication bias. They said by examining funnel plots, and then later on they talk um, about the median Haddad score for the study quality was two, range zero to five. Not really good. Okay, but not really good. Most people, when they're writing articles now or doing their studies, try to uh, take into account the Haddad score when you're writing the article. The reason for that is if you have a higher Haddad score, your article is of higher quality based on how somebody assesses it. Therefore, the impact factor of the journal would go up. Therefore, the journal likes you better. Therefore, the article is more likely to be reviewed by a quality filter group. So trying to get a good Haddad score when you're writing the basic research is now a goal. And they also said they found no evidence of possible publication bias for either the primary or secondary outcomes, and they didn't demonstrate the funnel plots at all. Now, if you're really concerned that they made a big, you could write to Dr. Sung and ask her to see them. And lastly, were the studies reproducible? Well, the details is you'll read when you read the article in the methods section. So one, two, three, four, it's four pages, four, five, six pages of methods is describing it pretty well in depth. So let's take a look at the results. So how do we feel about, how do we feel about it? We said there was a good question, we said there was a good question, we said it was searched pretty well, we said there was no publication bias, we said that dad scores were a bit weak, so we might want to ding the study, but we said you could reproduce it. So how do you feel about this? this is this a good, mild, poor study, a good uh, article, a poor article, or a in, in the middle of the road article? Pardon? A good article? Good article. So a Canadian would usually say it's middle of the road because a Canadian always tries to stay in the middle of the road. They don't, um, they don't, we don't, um, but I, I would actually agree with you. I think it's actually a pretty reasonable article for what's been done. So were the remember that we have, now have to look at those studies. So Dr. Sung has told us we should combine these results, but now can we do that? So we're going to look at the concept of heterogeneity. And remember that when we went through the session, we talked about where are the dots? Where's the bars around the dots? So do the, are the dots close enough together that you feel comfortable combining the studies? When you look at the lines with the dots, do they overlap so you can combine the studies? And then you get a gut feeling or a guesstimate of what's going on, and then you just go down and check, does the statistical test support what you felt when you looked at the picture? And remember, this is different. When you're reading a systematic review, there's two p-values. There's the p-values for the test of heterogeneity. In that one, we want to be as close to one because we want as little bias to affect us combining those studies. And then there's the p-value of the result. And that one is the standard p-value we're looking for, which should be as small as possible. So you want a, as big as possible for heterogeneity, but for the results you want small as possible. And if there's anything you can take away, that's probably the most, uh, that's probably the best point you can take away, because if you can remember this when you're reading the article, then it won't confuse you with the p-value. And then we talked about the I-square, which is about a five-year-old test, and we want values closer to 0% to show that there's little uh, bias or little uh, heterogeneity within the studies. So firstly, we went, to, if you go to table two, just looking at all Coros mortality, they, the stats were that there was 80 studies for everybody, um, for all cause, and infection-related mortality, there's 67. The relative risk was 0.95, but interestingly, it went from 0.84. So remember we said if, if the relative risk was less than one, that would tell us that GCSF was supportive. Without looking at the p-value, the confidence interval tells us that the GCSF may be as good as 16% improvement, but it also may be as high as 8% as above. So it actually may increase your risk based on this confidence interval of having an infection. So it goes from being really good. So that's what the confidence interval helps you. Whenever the confidence interval crosses one, that means that there's, it's not statistically significant, and that should be supported by a p-value that's not statistically significant. So boom, you've got a confidence interval that crosses one and the p-values, so it means there's no statistical difference between the people getting GCSF and the people not on whether or not they die. 
if you look at infection-related mortality, the relative risk is 0.82. Again, the value crosses 1. So bang, that means that the, the p-value should not be statistically significant. People may call this trending, but it's 0 0.07. And um, they do a risk reduction as well, an absolute risk reduction, which we talked about, which is a subtraction number. And again, it is not statistically significant. But we're really concerned about the pediatric studies. So they've actually done a forced, this is not a forced plot, they've done a summary plot of just taking the mortality for pediatric cases. And when you combine all the studies, remember this side favors GCSF or favors treatment, and this side favors the control. Specifically for mortality, um, it again, it crosses the line of no effect. So statistically, it's not going to be significant, 0.3. Um, the relative risk is this number they're calling is 1.46. So it means GCSF, if you're just looking at the point estimate, may actually increase your risk of having a death than if you, um, than if you don't receive GCSF. So, and it could, but it can also mean that GCSF actually helps you um, down to the bottom of 0.42, but it also may go all the way up to 5.1 as a relative risk. So essentially the take-home point is that it crosses the line of no effect and therefore is not statistically significant. Same for infection-related mortality. The dot is almost exactly on the line, but the confidence interval crosses the line of no effect. Um, for documented infections, it touches the line. So it touches the line of no effect, so it's not statistically significant, 0.7. For microbiologically documented infections, well, here, um, sorry, it's this line here. It doesn't. It crosses the line of effect as well, of no effect. And then, lastly, for febrile neutropenia in pediatrics, it comes darn close to one. And again, the statistical significance is all is not helpful. So, in all cases, when you're looking at, at the summary, and this is just a summary graph. But if we go to the forest plots, remember we talked about the forest plot, this is where we looked at the point estimates and we looked at the summary statistic, the diamond, and the size of the diamond is the confidence interval. So they did a lot of studies. Um, Stan Calderwood did a study in 1994, Raccoon and Pewey down at St. Jude's, um, some other people did studies as well. But look, they, did, they enrolled all these patients, but in, if you're looking for um, all-course mentality, Calderwood, you didn't die if you're in the treatment group and you didn't die if you're in the control group. So they could not really estimate what the difference was. And the same here. So all these studies where there was no events. But when you get to the bigger studies, you start to get, but you get, so you still cross the line of no effect. And the summary statistic crosses the line of no effect. And I'm going to come to the stats, this thing, in, in a second. I think on the next slide, no. We looked at the pediatric for infection-related mortality. Again, if you don't have any events, you can't estimate. But again, the summary statistic is on the line of no effect, so it doesn't show any benefit from ju using GCSF. And again, the statistic value is 0.97, so it's not statistically significant. Sorry. So if we look at that, how do you feel about whether or not you should use GCSF in patients, in children with um, cancer? Would you feel comfortable using it or? Not really, okay. It depends on what I'm looking at. That's a good point. Um, she, she does in the article, if you get the whole article, she does look at all those different values. Again, for each, she, they said in their study that the primary outcome objective was uh, all case mortality, whether or not you died or not. They do look at all the secondary objectives as well where they can get the information. Again, there's so few pediatric studies, but again, none of them really support using GCSF in any way, in a strong opinion. So, um, just in summary, we did do a critical appraisal, a systematic review in this large group. We assessed heterogeneity, remembering that you look at the point estimates, you look at the confidence intervals, you get a gestalt or a gut feeling about whether or not um, there is heterogeneity, whether or not there's variation between studies. Then you look at the numbers, you're looking for a p-value that is close to one. And those three tools are the point estimate, the confidence interval, and the statistical test.
And thank you very much. Thanks. The question was, um, in a lot of the cases, if you're looking at secondary outcomes, a lot of times the information isn't there. And there's so much heterogeneity among those different outcomes and how people decided on those terms that they didn't feel really comfortable putting the studies together. Within the body of the method section, she does describe the method and they used a random effects model, trying to account for the randomness that just happens. But even when you do that, they didn't get enough they had too much heterogeneity that they didn't really feel comfortable uh, interpreting from that. They did do the graphs, and you can look at them if you go on the line. There's a whole bunch of uh, appendices attached on the website to the article. But really, there's so much variation in those studies, so much variation as we went back to the, to the patients that were in the study, so much variation into the intervention, the GCSF, how it was given, which route it was given, so much variation in how they map, how they collected the outcome, what is, when death is pretty definite, you're either dead or alive, it's binary, but when you sort of infection related mortality and, and then the whole problems with um, uh, microbiology bases, did they really grow the bug? Did did they have? Did they grow for all types of bugs, or did they just select for certain ones? And so, when you get into that, there's a lot of heterogeneity because different labs may they may culture for certain bugs, but not do other ones. Where another lab may culture for a wide variety of uh, micro, microbiologic agents. So that's heterogeneity at a at a very broad level, and that's all they're saying. There's just too much variation, and no matter how they tried to combine it, they couldn't get rid of it using this random taking away the randomness, there was just other, too much other factors in there. So that's why she doesn't feel comfortable. Does that help? If you're specifically looking for that, you'd have to say, um, and this, other than that one other Cochrane, um, which I didn't show to you from 2005, other than that, you're going to have to say there's not enough evidence out there to, to make a decision. And you're going to have to use your preferences for your center, for your lab, for your people. That's still evidence-based medicine. Because you have gone and looked for the evidence. There is none. And it also, one of the advantages of this, then it starts to stimulate research that people could possibly do. Maybe you want to do that study here to look at that effect as well. Thank you.